It's my pleasure to introduce Andy Hodgson of Uber. Andy, tell us first of all, what, what do you do at Uber? Uh, thanks, Julian. So I am the head of finance for Northern Europe, which is one of our geographic regions uh, at Uber, containing one of our largest and most important cities, London. Everybody knows a little bit about Uber. Tell us as cleanly and as succinctly as possible, what is Uber's business model? How does Uber work? How does Uber make money? Sure. So Uber is, uh, at its core, two apps. Uh, a rider app and a driver app. And the whole idea is that we are a platform that connects riders to drivers uh, in the most efficient way possible. And in terms of how Uber makes money and how Uber has disrupted uh, the existing incumbent trade, it's all about finding areas of opportunity for efficiency. So you look at a traditional uh, cycle that a, that a taxi driver or a taxi cab company goes through, and there is a length of time where they are waiting for a, a, a request from a rider. There is then a period of time between that request where the driver has to get to where the rider is, then there's a time when they're on trip. What Uber is attempting to do through a combination of technology uh, and also leveraging scale is to shrink down the controllable elements of that cycle. So particularly, the uh, length of time it takes between, for a request to come in to a driver, um, primarily through there being a significant number of riders to make those requests, and then also through clever supply positioning and dynamic pricing to help with supply positioning to lower the time from that request coming to the driver to the driver picking you up. What that enables you to do as a driver is be on a trip earning money for uh, a longer time in one of those cycles. So the proposition to, the, to you and me as a, as a rider is basically we're just getting a slightly cheaper ride. The proposition to the driver is we're basically going to keep you busy for longer, you're just going to basically spend more of your time driving and less of your time waiting yes. around. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, but it's it, because what you can do, if you can create enough efficiency, both the, both the rider and the driver can end up better off because the driver is only earning money when they're driving. So if they are driving more, they can make a little bit more money. For the rider, we can actually reduce the prices down because we don't need to generate so many trips in an hour to create the same amount of total economic value. But this assumes that somehow we're going to increase the size of the pie because obviously, you know, if all you're doing is taking business away from somebody else, it doesn't quite work. So is, is the vision here that somehow we're just going to grow the number of people who are taking, taking rides? Ab absolutely it is. And that's, that's exactly what Uber's done. That's how Uber's reached the scale it has. Um, because we still see it as a price-led thing. So we are attempting as a transportation provider to hit a certain price point, And there is always more we can do to generate more efficiency out of those controllable elements of a, of a trip cycle. And we keep pushing as hard as we can there. Whenever we push on those, we pass the benefit as much as possible to the rider in terms of reduced prices. The idea being that the more you reduce prices and the more you cut prices, you can keep the, the driver whole, but that improved price point keeps uh, riders coming onto the platform and you get scale. And just talk briefly about this notion of dynamic pricing. This is the idea that the price I pay is actually a function of, of how busy it is. Is that right? Uh, yes, to a point. So it's much publicised surge pricing is what it's normally called. And what that means is that in specific, uh, we call them hexagons, we divide the whole, a whole city up into specific hexagons. And depending on the balance between proximity of drivers and number of requests, the algorithm in the system will automatically uh, potentially raise the price. The idea being that that price gets flashed up both to the rider and their request, but also to all the drivers across the city. So that has the effect of encouraging drivers to move closer to where the demand is. It also has the effect of suppressing demand because the price has gone up for the rider. So does this actually happen after a concert or a big football game has just finished? You actually see drivers moving to that place? Absolutely it does. Absolutely it does. And it flashes up and that's the, a core part of the driver app, uh, which shows exactly where those are to really encourage those movements. Now we know that Uber as a company is still losing money. Uh, and it's obviously not unusual for a, a fast-growing company to lose money. Uh, why is that? Is that simply because you are investing your profits, or are you actually struggling to make some markets profitable in their own right? Yeah, really interesting question. So we absolutely are reinvesting our profits, um, because you do still have to pay something, especially in the early days in cities, to acquire riders and drivers to get the thing moving. However, the underlying economics of Uber, especially at scale, uh, a city like London is a great example, is uh, healthily profitable. Um, you can absolutely, where you're not having to subsidise the market, uh, it runs on its own. Uber takes a cut of every ride. You can see how you quite quickly get to a profitable position there. The problem that we faced and why we're losing so much money is that uh, in the current environment for the last few years, you've had uh, what I would describe as a glut of global capital flowing into ride sharing. 
Um, and what that means is that when you've got companies, uh, the big competitors around the world as we currently stand are uh, Lyft, uh, Didi in China, uh, Grab in Southeast Asia, for example. When they are flush with cash and looking to grow, it becomes very tempting to artificially subsidize the market by pushing that money that you've got from venture capitalists, from, from banks, etc., into uh, rider and driver subsidy. What that does, it manipulates the market and actually the only way to counteract that that we found effectively is to match it. Right. And you almost end up in an arms race. And it's the, it's the flip side of that arms race that has meant uh, we've lost money because we've had the cash available to spend. And so presumably, just like with many other platform type businesses, I'm thinking like of Amazon, Amazon Prime, you are trying to find ways of increasing the stickiness to try to persuade people to use Uber and not to use one of these competitors. And any, any progress in that, in that challenge? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. And that's a really big challenge for us. Um, we've, we've struggled, to be honest. I mean, we've absolutely tried and looked at various different angles. We've looked at, uh, at attempting to create loyalty programs and, and punch cards and things like that, but none have really sparked. Um, what we've found with taxi transportation, effectively, or, or ride-sharing transportation, is that uh, it is actually very transactional and it's very price-driven. So the best thing that we can do to create sustainable advantage is actually to make sure we're always the lowest priced offering. And hopefully we can do that rather than through subsidy. Right. And this is where we put all our focus on actually continually improving the product, right. continually improving the experience to create more efficiency, right. enabling us so to, to On grow. the margin, you become the platform of choice, which encourages both drivers and, and passengers. That's absolutely the aspiration. That's, that's <laughs> Briefly to finish, um, what's the vision for the future? Everyone knows driverless cars are on the way. What does the, uh, the current chief executive see Uber's going to look like 10 or even 20 years from now? Yeah, so it's really interesting. We have a relatively new chief executive at this stage, so his vision is still forming. But from what I can see so far, um, absolutely that autonomous vehicles are a critical part of our future. So we are busy investing a significant amount in the technology to make sure we're a leader in that space, because certainly the perceived wisdom at this stage is that a ride-sharing network of some sort will be a critical component in a, in a world of autonomous vehicles. The ultimate idea, uh, and I find this, uh, this is one of the inspirations for me being at Uber, is that uh, if you think about the cost structure of Uber, the, the, the wages of the driver or the driver cost is still a significant part of, of that stack. If you move to a world of autonomous vehicles and can spread the cost of an autonomous car across a number of rides, you can actually bring the price to the consumer down significantly. To the point we were making earlier, that hopefully opens Uber up to a whole new world of consumers. And I believe there's a tipping point where, it, in particularly densely urban areas, certainly first densely urban areas, there will be a tipping point where it becomes more economically useful for people or more economic value for people to use the ride sharing network than it will to own their own car. Right. And at, at that point, that's when you get into real global transformational uh, and as effects. As soon as you and I are prepared to not own a car anymore and to use Uber or Uber's competitors, then that does have these transformational effects on city centres. Exactly, and that's what I find really exciting. So some of the research that we've commissioned, I think it was, I think it was HBS that did the study, estimates that 90% of cars on the road today will not be needed in that world where uh, everyone is using ride-sharing effectively and shared autonomous vehicles. If you remove 90% of the cars from a city, that's what becomes really exciting for me. That's what becomes truly transformational. The level of infrastructure that is taken up with parking spaces, um, Imagine if all of that turned to, turned to parks. Wow. Um, yeah, very exciting stuff. <laughs> thank you very much, Andy. No problem. Thank you, Julian.